Um, so I'm Gabrielle Kleinwax from One Day Sooner, um, and I'm going to be talking about adaptive platforms for biomedical research. Um, but uh, briefly, what even is One Day Sooner? Um, so we are a fairly small uh, public health and pandemic risk reduction uh, nonprofit. Um, <laughs> you may know us as from the at the beginning of COVID. Um, we were the people saying, hey, we would really like to participate in COVID challenge trials in order to accelerate the development of a vaccine. Please let us get infected with COVID for this purpose. Um, and this uh, did not uh, move particularly quickly. Um, so we wound up expanding from there into a ton of other projects. Uh, some of it is advocacy for other types of challenge trials in non-emergency situations at this point. Um, some of it is a broader policy, regulatory policy, um, and related areas. Some of it is poll funding advocacy, um, which I will talk about later on in this exact talk. And it's very difficult to fit everything under uh, one umbrella. Um, Josh Morrison, one of the co-founders, likes to call it meta-science advocacy. He admits that this is a difficult term to understand, but this is probably the right crowd for it. Um, so basically, the general tack is that we want to improve regulatory, or I'm sorry, uh, biomedical research processes and policies. Um, and so that's one day sooner. And specifically here, I'm going to be just zooming in on a fairly small piece of what we do, um, which is adaptive platforms for biomedical research through the lens of my project on indoor air quality. So, um, there is in a lot of biomedical research a general problem of acquiring information because biomedical research is so expensive and takes such a long time. So a lot of the studies that you would love to run, they're gonna cost tens of millions of dollars and you don't get to test everything that you would want to possibly test in order to really uh, get all the information that you might assume is, is necessary. So this is a, a basically a meta issue that you can, um, if you, if you target making your information acquisition as efficient as possible, getting the maximum possible value out of it also, then you are targeting um, multiple areas at the same time. Um, and so this is the, the central problem that I want you to keep in mind as the, the, the information acquisition and uh, coordination I want you to keep that in mind for the duration of this talk. So zooming in on indoor air quality specifically, quick history lesson. Um, many pathogens, many of the most you know, dangerous pathogens historically, are aerosolized respiratory pathogens. This includes measles, smallpox, tuberculosis, um, definitely COVID, right? And, uh, and to some extent flu as well. Um, probably one of the more difficult, um, one of the most difficult source control problems, right? It's just breathing. <laughs> it's very, very difficult as compared to, for example, in fighting cholera, you can take the handle off a water pump. Um, this is a famous study, uh, epidemiological study. Um, but source control is much harder for respiratory, aerosolized respiratory pathogens. So there are known methods of cleaning the air, broadly falling under ventilation, filtration, and germicidal ultraviolet light. The third one uh, is, extreme, is, is the most efficient, uh, cleans the air the fastest, um, deactivates the pathogens the fastest. And a lot of people think that it sounds very new, but uh, this is a paper from 1961 <laughs> demonstrating that we have known about the effect of ultraviolet light in cleaning air since 1961, um, and that it is highly efficient and really dramatically reduces uh, disease transmission. This is for tuberculosis. Tuberculosis has been a global problem for a very long time now. And so this potentially should raise the question for you, why is it, uh, why is it that we have struggled so much to clean our air properly. We've just undergone a global pandemic and 
most buildings look exactly the same as they did before the pandemic. So I'm going to say that this is a problem of information, knowledge gathering, that is directly causing or directly intertwined with a coordination problem. It's like a classic coordination problem. So, it is fair to say that the majority of studies of controls for airborne infection transmission have been failures or near failures. In many of these attempts, however, failure was almost implicit in the study design. This is from a canonical text from some of the most respected experts in their field who are saying that most studies in their field are not going to, uh, are not going to succeed at showing the thing that they are investigating, which should really alarm you. <laughs> I will, I will argue that they will really, that this should really alarm you. And by the way, I cribbed this slide, I should not take credit for putting this quote on a slide like this. I cribbed the slide from uh, Professor Don Milton of the University of Maryland, um, an excellent researcher um, who specializes in flu transmission, because this to me in a talk I saw from him was the single most impactful slide that I had seen in a talk, period. Um, just because of what it says about the state of the research. Why is it so difficult to perform this research? It is, it is the same uh, problem that you face with a lot of epidemiological, or a lot of uh, disease transmission research in general, that there are just a lot of variables at play, a huge number of variables at play, and many of them are quite difficult to control. And so what winds up happening is that um, in one really classic case, for example, you will have uh, some intervention that you install and you can't, and, and it makes it's perfectly clear that this intervention was very, very effective. And then you move to a different environment and under many of the same conditions, so these are real world studies we're talking about, not in a clinic, because the real world is what you care about, right? Um, so once you move to this other environment, this intervention does, is, uh, is not as effective and the effect doesn't replicate because there are minor differences in the specific, um, in, in a classic case, it's that if you um, are installing air cleaning technology in a school, you know, you see the rate of transmission slow down across the population of school children, but uh, they still catch the, um, they still catch pathogens on the bus or at play dates at their house or in any public space. And so you can't replicate the, the study finding. Now, what does this translate to? That type of information problem of, of like the inability to replicate, the inability to control all your variables, all of these details, this becomes directly a classic collective action problem because you can see how the party that invests heavily in installing um, the various types of air cleaning technology that they might want does not internalize all the benefits of that technology. You're an office manager. You spend a lot of money trying to clean your office spaces. And then you, and because you think that you, you want to improve your bottom line by uh, reducing sick days. And then your employees get sick not at the office. They go to restaurants and theaters and their kids come home from school and, uh, and they get sick. You spend time and effort and money installing air cleaning technology in your own home in order to host dinner parties, but then anywhere else you go, you can get sick. And so this is just a, a very standard collective action problem, right? So we want to, um, one day sooner, is, is working on a project to organize a, a buyer's club. Um, I, have been, <laughs> I have been deficient in enunciating this before. Buyers with a B, not, like a, not a virus club to be clear. Um, so the, the idea here is to coordinate the, um, the, the adoption and the knowledge gathering in order to jump this hurdle of the collective action problem. So, 
the form of it is uh, <laughs> in this diagram because it is um, somewhat, somewhat complicated. Um, what we are trying to do is coordinate between adopters, technological adopters, funders who are potentially interested in you know, public health, uh, research teams, and the eventual, we'll say, future buyers, like future potential buyers and policy makers. Um, and so the idea is that in this first set, um, in the first, you know, just this is organizing buyers in stages. In the first set, you have some set of buyers who agree to install this technology and host studies. And these studies um, are, are hosted in, in the environments, in whatever environments they're hosted in. They have shared protocols that the research team have agreed upon in advance that this is the way that um, studies in environment one can be transferred to environment two. And the protocols are, are designed for all these various environments that you might want to execute studies in. So that at the end of the day, you, can, um, you have a dedicated model or a dedicated set of statistical techniques that will allow you to incorporate the environmental differences and add your data sets together. So you both power your studies more effectively that way, and you also can split out environment by environment and understand um, what each environment looks like. And hopefully this allows you to predict for a future buyer, somebody comes to you and you know, says, I'm interested in this, but uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work in my, like, will I really see a benefit from this technology in my office building or school or retirement home or any of these, you know, millions of places that you would want this technology? And you can use this adaptive model to predict what the, um, you know, what, what benefit the buyer might see and update it with the data that you're receiving. And um, at the same time, you have buyers who are able to make commitments based on those, on those future study results and say, if we see this type of, uh, like, let's say, a result in this range um, for how effective this has been in these environments, we will we will make uh, we will make purchases for our environment, um, and so the 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 general overview is a special case of adaptive trial design, which is um, these protocols that will allow you to update your trials as data comes in, and so having just explained the structure to you for this one specific indoor air quality. Um, project. There are plenty of other examples where you can imagine adaptive trials design, design being useful. So for example, in vaccine trials, you might be interested in how, in what, um, what vaccine dose is the most effective. You might have a limited amount of the vaccine to give out. This was clearly the case in COVID where as many people as possible wanted the vaccine. Um, an adaptive trial, if a protocol had been designed in advance to allow trials to be updated as data was coming in, then you would be able to, um, it's, it's an explore exploit problem, right? You'd be able to start with a couple of uh, like different groups of how much vaccine each group was getting and then use an adaptive model and adaptive trial design to pursue the more promising group and you know, more carefully investigate that area. Um, this is another a, a term you can search for if you're interested in learning more about this is Bayesian statistics. Uh, this is all, I'm not personally a clinician. I learned all of this stuff from a biostatistician that we work with um, who writes about Bayesian statistics. So um, if this is uh, so great, why isn't it in common use right now? Um, pretty natural question. There's apparently, um, so a survey was run across, just survey of statisticians was run, 
um, and clinicians rather, I'm sorry. So a survey of clinicians was run who said the central problem was they were unfamiliar with uh, these statistical methods. So clearly there needs to be greater familiarity, um, more Bayesian statistics needs to be taught to clinicians. But also, um, regulatory authorities need to have uh, guidelines that will give researchers confidence that if they, um, if they perform this type of trial, it will actually be accepted for approval, right? And this is not <laughs> many, th this audience is not necessarily always the most uh, regulation friendly, right? But given that regulatory authorities do exist, um, there should be clear communication between these regulatory authorities and manufacturers, researchers, anybody who is interested in getting any medical product licensed, what the actual expectations are. So the FDA is actually, by the way, interested in um, Bayesian statistics and is supposed to be putting out guidelines, I believe, in 2025. So this is a work in progress, actually. Um, another element of this, to go back to the Indoor Air Quality Project, I, I uh, discussed buyers committing to certain purchases, right? So um, this is... <laughs> That's not what an advanced market commitment typically is, but I thought this was thematically similar enough that I want to drag advanced market commitments into this. So advanced market commitments um, are a so so advanced market commitments are a great way to maintain um, you know momentum in research and and development. And the typical form is the a, a large central buyer. Um, will say anybody who produces, they'll put out specs and say anybody who produces a product that meets these specs uh, will buy whatever quantity from them. Um, so this was used, this is used for um, vaccines, for example, the, um, the Vaccine Alliance and um, used this for pneumococcal vaccines. Um, Operation Warp Speed did this for COVID vaccines in the United States. Um, so this is, in these cases, it's the government is the, is the bulk purchaser. Um, but this is also, uh, this is, this is a, an adaptive method for the manufacturer. You can imagine, going back to the case of indoor air quality, if you do reach a point where, um, you know, let's say the government is very convinced of the use of these technologies as, and is excited about installing them in schools across the country, they can put out such a request saying, these are the specs that need to be met and manufacturers will update their own manufacturing techniques and um, their product in order to be able to fulfill more bulk purchases. So uh, right now there's a very small number of um, companies actually like in this space, but the promise of future commitments is pull funding. This is a pull funding mechanism, right? The promise of future commitments should show promise that there can be more companies that can enter the space and target these potential uh, future buyers. So. What is the overall vision for the Indoor Air Quality Project? The hope is for this eventual effect where we are able to coordinate among buyers and researchers and potential reg and regulatory bodies and potentially policy makers um, in order to understand the information needed in order to create, you know, enable mass widespread adoption of um, indoor air cleaning products through these adaptive research techniques, right? Um, and I would actually, incidentally, as this is a prediction, is a forecasting conference, uh, I would love for there to be a clear model of what thresholds you see. I think there are, prob there are likely to be large threshold effects in you know, the amount of air cleaning technology that you see in the United States versus disease transmission overall. So if 
indoor air cleaning technology is instituted in 10% of public spaces in the US. What does this actually do to disease transmission nationwide? I would love to see that model, if anybody's interested in messing around with that. Um, but that being said, this, the, the hope is if you, get in, you know, if you get air cleaning technology everywhere, if everybody you know, updates their, uh, their air quality in this way, um, then you have no more airborne disease, right? This is the meth this is this is the pathway, I I think. This is the pathway to ending flu season. And so this is potentially one of the I mean, of course I think this. I've been working on this for a while, but I think this is one of the highest leverage public health points at like in the US right now is addressing in you know indoor air quality. Um, and Indoor air quality is a information gathering problem, which is why we're so interested in working with the forecasting techniques and predictive modeling and all of these other elements. Um, so, you know, have to do a title drop, obviously. With the help of this community, we can do all of this one day sooner. <laughs> Um, so yeah, questions are welcome and oh. thank you, thank you. Um, and also incidentally, I should say we are, uh, questions are welcome and also feedback on the general plan. Um, so I was not really, uh, yeah, I, I, this is like clearly glossing a lot of details. So anything, any, anything anyone's interested in. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, one thing you. that you touched on was around how you are identifying that um, it's a lack of uptake um, and trust, I suppose, in more new uh, research design methods. Um, and in this case, I feel that, you know, uh, the cost of getting it wrong is pretty low because you're installing, like, air purifiers. But I suppose more broadly for, you know, other issues, say, like a drug or something, um, the negative effects could be much larger. Um, you know, w would you still say that um, these sort of research techniques should be more broadly adopted in that case? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I would say I, I think that it is difficult uh, to... I, I don't have the uh, expertise in Bayesian statistics <coughs> myself. So if you, if you look at the research papers on this, I'm just now quoting what I've read, um, these techniques should allow you to have greater confidence. It's not saying you use fewer people if that's not what your, if your statistical model says you should use the same number of people as if this were not a you know, adaptive uh, study, then you should use the same number of people, right? So the, the adaptive study design isn't saying, you know, go faster in all respects all the time. It's saying sometimes you don't need to do the trial, you know, the exact same way as you used to. And in fact, one, um, one way in this, can, this can be helpful to people who participate in these tri in, in trials in general is that the, the standard way to do, um, so, so the protocol has to be accounted for, the protocol is laid down in advance of the trial beginning. So if a, if a protocol is an adaptive protocol, then you know that in advance. Uh, the standard way to do a protocol, to, to write a protocol right now, more, more typically, is, is just that it's, you know, we're gonna do, we're gonna use this many people um, and we're gonna give them this dosing uh, and whatever other details at the end. And so, as you're getting data in, as the data is rolling in, you might see that the drug or any whatever is ineffective. And it's rare that it would be so dangerous as to cut off the trial early, but uh, you don't want to take an unnecessary, you don't want to, you don't want to take an unnecessary, you don't want to unnecessarily participate in a trial, right? There's, you know, plenty of, it's, it's a, 
the, the it's time intensive and effort intensive and it wastes a lot of money for the company involved and it, it wastes a lot of resources for the people involved potentially. So in a non-adaptive design, even if you're getting, even if it looks, it's starting to look like the drug isn't promising, you have to finish the trial, you have to follow through. And in adaptive design, if, if the study protocol accounted for this, um, you would be able to end the trial early. Thank you. Sure. So you have a physics, you have a physics background, and I do too. Um, if we're th if we're imagining, you know, filters, they basically we're pumping the air through a room, and it gets through a little box, and there's and then we flash it with UV at that point in the box, and then we pump the air back into the room. We're not thinking about flashing the whole room with UV, right? We're thinking about. Uh, uh, we are thinking about flashing the whole room with UV. Not not just flashing the air as it pumps through. Correct, because I think I think as you're as you're um, getting at, I think that wouldn't uh, do that much. It would right, the, clean all the air. <laughs> well, so so what, the measure that gets used is effective air changes per hour. Right. Um, effective air changes per hour is limited by the. Uh, like if it, let's say you're putting the UV, more, most commonly you put the UV in a duct. Right. You're limited by the amount of air that can go through that duct, which is not a lot relative to what. Uh, so what's the typical cycle time? So on an airplane, I'm told it's every five minutes. They cycle the yeah. entire airplane every five minutes. So that that sounds fast enough, right? An airplane, uh, yeah. Airplanes actually have quite good indoor air quality. Um, or sorry, they have. They, have, they often have high CO2 levels, but that's fine. Uh, th that's not like what we're talking about. Um, they, yes, the airplane air is, is cycled through quite quickly. Um, in your home, um, it might be every 30 minutes in a typical room in your home. Um, so... Uh, that sounds pretty good to me. Oh, I'm sorry. I did this backwards. Um, I did this backwards, uh, every two hours. Uh, it's, it's half an air change per hour. Like a typical right. home is at, is at 0.5 air changes per hour. Um, how much do you, how many equivalent air changes per hour do you need? It's not, just, it's not just how many equivalent air changes per hour is your filter getting you. It's how many equivalent air changes per hour do you need to fight a pathogen? And I, I care greatly about pandemic risk from novel pathogens. So if we're only talking about eliminating the flu, for example, um, air filters can be just fine, probably. Uh, so, so and still people aren't installing them. For, for flashing the room, like in this room, first of all, you need to wait till people are out of it. <laughs> and then even then under the table, under a chair, the flash isn't gonna get there, right? And unless you're gonna put mirrors everywhere. I mean, I'm not. So I didn't go into the technical details of the, techno of, of like the technology, but for UV light lamps, the most typical thing is upper room UV, which is directed across the ceiling and doesn't, it doesn't hit the people in the room at all. Right? That, that just doesn't hit the people in the room. So what's the cycle time of air the from, cycle the, time, from so the ceiling it, to the floor? So it'll reach, it's actually quite good. So, so upper room UV will reach, um, I'm trying to, there's like a balance between like, am I remembering the numbers correctly and like being able to give the answer fluidly, but I think it's about 10 air changes per hour for upper, 10 equivalent air changes per hour for upper room UV. <clears throat> Far UV is the like, cool new thing that everybody's talking about. Um, this is safe for human interaction and it achieves much higher equi equivalent air changes per hour. It's a very short wavelength of UV light. So my main qu comment is just gonna be, it seems like most of this is pretty insensitive to the particular pathogens. I, I don't, I'm not seeing the point of doing clinical trials for particular pathogens for this UV thing because you're trying to cover lots of pathogens anyway in an uncertain future. So you might as well just <laughs> have a robust thing that just kills lots of things, you know, like a wide... I agree with you. Right? So, so all your discussion about clinical trials and stuff, it seems beside the point. The question is, how can we get lots of places to install these somewhat expensive... That's exactly... It's, it's an economics question. It's not, it's not a <laughs> clinical trial question. That's exactly what we're trying to do. <laughs> but, but the clinical trials, the, the adaptive trials, all your, your prior commitments... So, you, question, so I, see, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So 
the adaptive trials thing is that the, the real world environments are hosting studies, which is the point of uh, like the, you, you convince a place to install, you, you can, you, a school installs extra air filters and the school hosts the study. All you're doing is just taking a school, you've already convinced the school to install the filters. And so then all you're doing is saying, hey, can we like count sick days? Can we count the students' sick days? So the point is not, the, the adaptive trials don't have to be in clinic trials. The idea of the adaptive, like the Bayesian statistics don't have to be only applied to in clinic trials. It seems like what we want to do is coordinate on some shared standard or rules where everybody would have to adopt them. So this adaptive each trial thing doesn't work for that. We, we need to decide what's the number, basically, how much UV per, uh, you know, how, how flashed how often at what intensity, at what elevation, and just agree on some rules and then implement that. You, you're not so the concern is that the concern is that if you try this now, there's very little impetus to do this because there is limited, um, like, there's limited evidence for entire communities for how it affects the entire community. As a policy, this isn't. Uh, like this isn't this is like this isn't very tractable at the moment. So as you are trying to, this is a market-friendly mechanism to get greater adoption that turns into good policy advocacy. I'm sorry, am I well, am I, I like, am I like phrasing this poorly? Why are they going to adopt these things unless there's some pressure to? I think you know any oh, as you've well, said, so any one room is a small fraction of the experience of any one person who walks through that room. So they, they don't have very much strong incentive to clean that room in order to help all the people who walk through that room. But it's if you're a, if a you're, coordination problem, like you said, right? If you're in an office space, you're in this office space for eight hours a day. So the office, you're hoping that, e that, that some of the environments that you install this in actually do see uh, an effect to their bottom line. And some of them are not necessarily going to see an effect to their bottom line, but off, but you know, different environments do pro-social, like participate in pro-social things all the time for the purposes of understanding, like you can imagine Google, Microsoft, these like workplace quality standard setters that everybody else in the field tries to copy saying we have the cleanest indoor air. Maybe it doesn't make, maybe at this point in time, it doesn't make a huge change to their bottom line, but they get to say we have the cleanest indoor air, we have the best workplace quality. And so then that, it gets the ball rolling, so to speak. And then you try to expand into the entire community. And once the whole town adopts, not even the whole town, let's say, once multiple places where people can hypothetically get infected start cleaning their indoor air thoroughly, you're able to see a, a greater shift in the amount of disease transmission. Hello, hi, Gabrielle. Um, so uh, what about conferences? Doesn't that seem like a good use case uh, because you have a lot of people? Yes. And, uh, <laughs> yes, also, it does. How much would it cost for next year for Manifest? Um, great question. So sorry, I'm thinking about the volume of this room. <laughs> One second. Um, let's say for UV, Specifically, it's just easier. The numbers on that are just a little easier for uh, since there's like one company in the space right now, unfortunately. Um, let's say two to three thousand dollars per room, four thousand dollars for the larger rooms. Um, this is the difficulty of getting people to adopt in their own homes, by the way, right? Um, filters are cheap. I mean, tons of people have like HEPA filters, right? Like that's that's very affordable for a random individual. Um, a room like this, I don't. I, each filter is going to be rated for uh, some volume of air, but like a room like this, let's say a couple of HEPA filters. Let's say you spend you spend like three hundred dollars on a good HEPA filter. Um, so then each room for UV, let's say, would be like $3,000, and each uh, room this size for HEPA filters would be like $600. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Uh, Rachel is... Uh, 
building on that question, is there any chance of like implementation of, say, portable um, of the UV devices? Oh, um, great question. That's an R&D question, actually. Uh, I, there is one person who has made a portable UV device. Um, it's sort of, my understanding is um, as the bulb gets, that it's, an, it's a light intensity problem. So the light has to, there's, there, you know, the light has to be a certain amount of intensity to clean air efficiently. Um, and the smaller bulbs don't output enough, but I, I've heard like decent things about this one particular device. I think it's basically an R and D problem, though. I mean, hopefully, if you get more efficient bulbs that output a greater intensity for a smaller volume of bulb, it's again just like if there's more interest in the field, more companies enter it, they innovate more, you know, and we would see portable devices. Uh, hi. Um, is there any concern about ozone, as I understand it? I think yeah. ozone can be produced by UV light. So ozone is actually, it's, it's a great question because there, there are pollutants produced by UV light, but ozone specifically um, tends to stay at about the same levels as out, like the main mediator of ozone is, is the outdoor air, as a matter of fact. So even in rooms that have UV lights installed, the ozone level mostly tends to match outdoor air. Um, there's particulate matter pollution from UV, which is why in any room that had UV installed, you would also want to install filters. But the level of filtration that you need to reduce that particulate matter um, is less than the level of filtrate. So like UV light uh, will clean the air more quickly for the same expense, basically, even if you add a filter to then like pull out the particulate matter. Okay. Yeah, but, but you are right that there is a pollutant concern. Hmm. Yeah. So can you just help me understand what the configuration is of, I'm, I'm trying to envision, you know, are these uh, UV, um, sure. UV beams like, the thing you have to do the limbo under to crack the safe, or is so. it just um, <laughs> shining up onto the ceiling, or what? What is it? So upper. So there's two configurations. There's upper room UV, which is like in a box on the ceiling with a. So the plate uh, that forms the lower piece of the box is is just like a solid plate that you can't see through. The light doesn't touch you, and then the sides of the box let out beams, so they go across the ceiling, right? Um, I said it doesn't interact with people at all. There is then some reflection, but it's not, like the beam of light is not hitting you, right? Um, the far UV lamps, they actually kind of look like, have you, have you ever seen um, the light boxes that photographers use to like get good lighting on a particular object? They kind of look like that. Um, I believe that they're configured. They're the the same company that makes those. So we've got, we've actually bought those for a conference that we held, which is why I know what those specific ones look like. But they also make other configurations. So then, do you get other effects potentially on like I don't know I don't know how UV stabilized indoor paints are, but um, you know, do you get things like that? We get accelerated de accelerated degradation of materials inside. Um, great question. Uh, no, uh, no degradation of materials. Um, the concerns are the particulate matter slash volatile organic compounds, VOCs they're called, um, which again, filtration addresses this, but no degradation of just like the materials around you. Yeah. Uh, okay. I... I remember reading about this early in COVID and hospitals were speculated as the obvious high value application. Is that, so are hospitals doing this? So um, some are. Um, one thing that we heard from, so uh, actually, you know the, 
The high, maybe the highest profile place I've seen this so far is Dulles Airport, Dulles International Airport in uh, right outside of DC, has uh, upper room UV. Um, if you go to one of the terminals, uh, I don't think they're in the main area. I think they're in like security and the terminal. So if you go into one of the terminals and you look at like, there's just like boxes attached to the ceiling, that's UV light. <laughs> Um, hospitals, I believe some of them have adopted UV, but there's all sorts of, of cases, right? Schools, students are packed very closely together um, and inter and like are co constantly breathing in each other's faces and you know, like just spend a lot more time in a lot closer proximity than adults do. Um, so that's an obvious case uh, for, I mean, definitely especially for extra filtration, which also gets rid of like all the particulate matter that you kick up in a school. Um, retirement homes are a really obvious use case, uh, just because people are immunocompromised. Cruise ships, because their business model relies on packing lots of people together in a close space. Oil rigs, same thing. Um, people just spend a, a ton of time like working very strenuous jobs very close together. Um, so lots of different Lots of different potential um, applications. Yeah. Um, okay. I think if that's everything, um, thank you so much for your attention and interest.